Well, hiking and camping with my 18th century equipment is how I became more confident with it. Today on the Deerskin Diary, I'm going to walk you through the equipment that I carry with me in my planning process for short weekend excursions. So stick around. There's bound to be something in here you can use. Now, one of the first things in my planning process is where I'm going, how long I'm going to be gone for, when I should be expected back, and the exact destination that I plan on making it to once I leave my vehicle. It's very important because that is how my loved ones know when they should expect to potentially hear from me again, and if they don't, where they should expect to start looking for me. I should add here that while this is extremely fun to do, there are inherent dangers that come along with it. For example, I'm using a knife, a tomahawk, an axe, I have you know, a, a horn full of gunpowder, I have a firearm with me, I'm uh, attempting to build and manage fire, I'm attempting to uh, regulate my body temperature and water intake and food while I'm out away from the modern conveniences that I'm so used to having. Now, last but not least, I take a good, long, hard look at the weather and the weather forecast. Because at the end of the day, this is supposed to be fun. I do want to challenge myself, and I do want to challenge my ability to use both my equipment in conjunction with the environment and try to get a, a um, specific 18th century experience. But I also am mature enough to set ego aside. If the weather looks like it will turn horrendous, then I will oftentimes adjust my expectations and my plans accordingly. I'm gonna start with my clothing choices, which are based on weather, because my clothing is the first line of defense that allows me to regulate my body temperature, so I've gotta be able to account for a multitude of temperature variances. Uh, which also means I'm probably going to get sweaty during the day. Actually, I have already a little bit, which means I'm going to be potentially uh, colder at night because of that wet clothing. I prefer to wear wool, even when it's slightly warmer outside, although that does have a, uh, a limit to it. I don't wear wool, uh, certainly in the summertime. But any time in the spring where I think it might be a little cooler at night especially, I do like to have some wool with me. Now this is a linen hunting shirt on the outside here. I have a linen body shirt underneath. I'm wearing a uh, actually a, a cotton neckerchief here, but I have a wool one that I can wear as well. Now on my legs, I have a pair of Virginia cloth or jean cloth breeches, and I've got my woolen leggings underneath that. I'll oftentimes wear these in terrain like this because uh, it's very thorny. I've got blackberry brambles and greenbrier brambles all throughout here, and they would just simply pick my trousers apart. So leggings, as we know historically, were a really good option for helping to protect the legs. So I've got these on. They should keep me nice and warm. They wick the moisture away fairly well, and they retain some of their insulating qualities even when they're wet. Now underneath these leggings, I do have a pair of thin wool stockings on, 18th century style stockings, and I oftentimes will wear socks with my moccasins. It adds a little bit extra padding, and those wool socks, again, they wick the moisture away and they retain some of their insulating qualities along with adding cushioning on the bottom of my feet. Footwear is actually one of the more important things that uh, I take into consideration before I go somewhere. If I know anything about the terrain that I'm going to be in, whether it's rocky, hilly, uh, a lot of pine straw, something like that, that tells me a little bit about what my footwear choices could be. I also take into account the amount of weight that I'm carrying in my upper body. You see, I wear a pair of boots every day uh, at work, and so my feet are not necessarily accustomed to wearing moccasins and losing that ankle support. Although moccasins do give me a little bit better traction when I'm out. 18th century shoes like these uh, do give me some more ankle and foot support, but they 
lack basically any sort of traction on the bottom. They're just slick leather. I also have a pair of these. These are oftentimes called shoe packs, but they're basically just another version of a moccasin. And uh, they have a slightly harder sole and they are a good mix in between. They also, because they're made of slightly thicker leather than the deerskin moccasins that I'm wearing, um, also help to uh, repel surface moisture a little bit longer and keep your feet a little bit drier a little bit longer. So it's a good mix between uh, foot support and uh, foot comfort over a longer uh, time frame. And sometimes I'll either wear these or put these in my pack, especially if I'm up in the mountains and it's really, really rocky uh, terrain with those kind of round boulders that you find all along those mountain creeks. Now for the purposes of this video, I'm gonna be putting on my kit the way that I put it on each time. So the next layer after my clothing is gonna be uh, actually my fighting equipment, right? Now for the purposes of camping and hiking, I don't necessarily need that. I traded out my uh, smaller, thinner tomahawk that I normally carry um, when I'm doing a scout impression or for living histories with this slightly stouter tomahawk, it has a little bit heftier of a pole, which is this flat part at the back, and it has a little bit wider blade and it's just a little bit heavier. It's much handier for cutting small things like firewood. Um, it's, it's a handier camp tool. I've got my flintlock fowler here today. I've got my powder horn and shot bag with some shot and some wadding and stuff in it. Um, if I finish up a little bit, Early today with this video, I've got time to go out on a squirrel hunt or a rabbit hunt. When, when I'm carrying my firearm and my fighting kit, when I'm out hiking or camping, one of the things that I have to consider is the effect that has on other people who aren't associated with my particular planned event. And so one of the things that I will do is if I encounter them and I notice that they notice me, we make eye contact or they may even say something, is I'll oftentimes either try to say something first or I will at least acknowledge that they have acknowledged me. And that goes a long way towards helping to comfort them because they don't know exactly what you're doing, right? Like I'm the only one that really knows what I have planned and why I'm out dressed like this and why I'm carrying this equipment. So a lot of times I'll, if I see them and they say something to me, I'll say something like, hey, don't mind me, just a history nerd or something similar because what I don't want is for them to be frightened. So I will say that if you choose to carry your weapon and you do encounter the authorities, you don't know why they are there. You don't know what that 911 call may have said. And so uh, always comply very quickly and, uh, and offer an explanation. And uh, most importantly, make sure that you have researched the laws for the area that you are in. And it may not be a matter of whether it's okay to carry the firearm or not. It may be whether or not there's a hunting season in and whether or not you are allowed to have the firearm and ammunition that you have based on the hunting season that's there. My next piece of equipment is a canteen. I'm using my tin canteen here. I also have a wooden canteen and I have a gourd canteen actually also. In addition, I have a glass bottle that I have some wire wrapped around and a handle uh, or a carrying strap rather added to it that I use. But the tin canteen is the safest. And what I mean by that is um, it's the one that's least likely to fall apart on me. And so typically, again, I'll carry this tin canteen and we'll talk about water purification in just a little bit. In my blanket roll, I keep my two wool blankets. I keep this scrap piece of hemp linen and I've got my green under wool waistcoat. It just simply ties in the front, but it's a good little insulating layer. I've got my bison wool hat for insulation. I've got a spare pair of thick wool stockings and I have a spare shirt that I can put on at night to stay dry. Now for food, I use my market wallet. This market wallet, it's a 18th century Walmart bag, if you will. It's got a slit up the center. It has two pockets on either end. And I use this almost exclusively for my food 
because it keeps my food separate from my um, my hygiene equipment, from my clothing. It keeps the grease from bacon and things off of uh, off my clothing and off of my other equipment. It's uh, it's washable, so I can take this once it gets nasty and and wash it later. And it's also something I can hang up on a branch. So if there are ants or uh, anything on the ground, I can oftentimes take and hang this from an S hook or hang this from a branch and it keeps it off the ground and it helps keep the bugs away from my food. Now, one of the things that I'll take with me a lot of times are these ship's biscuits or hard bread or hard tack as it's known. Um, these are a whole wheat flour and water. I don't add salt to these. And uh, these I will bake in two different thicknesses. A lot of times if I just want something to snack on as I hike, um, I will just make these thinner ones that, that break a whole lot easier, right? There's not much to that, um, and it's a little bit easier on my teeth. If it's something that I need to last a lot longer, I'll bake these thicker ones that are, uh, oh, there, that one broke, that's good, that are a little bit tougher to eat sometimes. Now for meat, oftentimes what I'll carry is a cured bacon like this. Um, it's, uh, it's salt cured, so it will keep out in the elements without refrigeration and I just keep it wrapped up in a towel here to try to keep the grease and salt off of some of the other items. I will also keep a separate small market wallet within this market wallet and that will carry some of my fresh vegetables. And here I have an onion and I have some potatoes, uh, some small potatoes that I can take with me. One of the main things that I look for in food choices is the ability for the food that I've chosen to carry other flavors. So for example, potatoes, cornmeal, flour, those all have the ability to be uh, sweet or salty depending on how I prepare them. So the same ingredient can be prepared in multiple different ways. I'm only going to be out for a couple of days, uh, at least that's the plan. And so as a result, I can bring just a few ingredients and based on how I mix them together, will satisfy the flavor profile that I'm going for. Now, I'll also carry some whole wheat flour in a bag just like this. There's, I can make um, it, small loaves of bread with this by the fire. I keep cornmeal with me. I can do the same thing with it. I can make cornmeal mush for breakfast. I can make that again sweet or savory. And of course coffee, this happens to be whole bean coffee, but all it takes is two pieces of firewood and you can grind it out to put in your cup or your small uh, tin for preparing coffee. This is my spice bag and this is where I carry all of my spices to help um, make my food a little more interesting and a little more palatable. In my spice bag I have a small brain tan bag with uh, salt. This is the salt that we made on a prior episode. I've got some maple sugar. I happen to like maple sugar more than I like other types of sugar so I make sure I carry some of that with me. I have some nutmeg and a small nutmeg grinder. I also happen to like nutmeg a lot and I think it goes with a lot of different dishes. And I have in this small bag, peppercorns that I can again grind up um, and, and add to seasoned food along with the salt. Now one piece of equipment I take when it's cold outside especially is an ax because this tool allows me to cut more firewood and that fire is an external way for me to help regulate my body temperature. Daniel Tribu said that, quote, we each had a good horse, rifle, and tomahawk. Some of the people in the fort said we would perish with the cold as we had no big ax to cut firewood at night. The things that'll get you uh, out here in the woods over a long period of time typically isn't some kind of illness and it's probably not going to be starvation, at least not in the eastern part of the United States where you're generally not terribly far from some degree of civilization or some degree of infrastructure like a cellular network where you could contact someone to come rescue you. The thing that will get you in the woods the fastest is hyperthermia and the inability to regulate your body temperature over time. I can go without sleep and I can go without food. I can even go for a short time without water. But if my body temperature starts to fall too quickly or it starts to fall too far, then I lose the ability to help myself and conduct any sort of self-rescue or an attempt at a larger rescue.
My knapsack is where I keep all of my sustainment kit. I have my fire kit here, which is carried in this uh, skunk bag, my char cloth, flint and steel, and there's some tow in there. I'm very serious about my ability to start and maintain a fire because my ability to regulate my body temperature helps me stay cognizant and it helps me stay um, ambulatory so I can help myself do all of the other things that I need to do. If my body temperature starts to get too low, then I start to deteriorate in other ways as well. And I begin to get on the losing side of that equation. And that's exactly what I'm trying to avoid. The only real vessel that I carry when I'm out uh, trekking is a small brass trade kettle like this one. In it, I can boil, um, I can eat out of it. There's just all kinds of little things that I can do with this. Uh, most of the meat cooking that I do is gonna be done on sticks over the fire anyway. It's gonna be some sort of roasted. Even with bacon, we traditionally fry it, but there's nothing wrong with, with like baking it or roasting it rather over a fire. Um, it eats exactly the same, and any wild game meat I may have or bring with me or, uh, or harvest along the way, I can do the same thing with. I have a moccasin repair kit here. It has an all some leather, some additional uh, strips of leather for ties and lacing. I have a spare pair of moccasins here as well. Very important uh, towards keeping my feet healthy. And I have my utensils here as well. So I have a wooden spoon and I have a twisted wire fork. In this small pouch here, uh, I just carry um, a fishing kit. I have my housewife here. It's a sewing kit. It's, it provides me with the ability to fix my clothing as is necessary. Now, in terms of what I carry that's modern, right? I carry two additional bags in this knapsack that uh, contain modern contents. The first one is this red wool bag here. And it's red for a reason. It's red because this is where my first aid and uh, equipment goes. And in this red bag, I actually have another red bag that contains all of the actual first aid equipment. This is a small survival kit. It has um, a, a, another way to make fire. It has some modern tinder in it. It has uh, some, some wire in it and some other things just one more little piece of insurance that I have while I am out. And then I have an extra battery pack and cables for a cell phone, especially if it gets cold outside, it can really sap that cell phone of its battery and uh, my ability to contact someone later on to ask them for help is extremely vital towards my health and my safety. In this red bag here, I have my first aid equipment. And I have a combination of regular first aid equipment for things like boo-boos, uh, you know, small cuts and scrapes. And then I have some trauma dressings in here as well. And I have some stuff for uh, joint injuries like shoulder injuries and ankle injuries. For medications, I've got some Advil for pain. I've got some um, allergy medication in here as well. And then I've got some, uh, some stuff for easing a stomach for diarrhea or something similar. Um, just again, my ability to stay hydrated is so important because if I become dehydrated, I lose the ability to self-rescue or I lose the ability to help myself in other ways. This is in a red bag for a very good reason. And I wanna thank Nathan Kobuck for showing me this idea, very, uh, very good idea. It's red because it's a form of nonverbal communication um, to, to the people that I'm with, right? So they know that red uh, is associated with danger and red is associated with an emergency. And so if they need to go into my to get my first aid equipment, they don't have to dig through a bunch of stuff. They know to just grab the red bags and carry them over. We oftentimes think that we will be completely ambulatory and completely uh, within our own regular thought process if we were to go over uh, and grab our first aid equipment and begin working on ourselves. You may not be in the condition that you are now when it's time to use your first aid equipment. So you want to choose things that you can use with one hand, for example, um, or when one leg's not working, um, when you can't move from the spot that you're in. Uh, you want to be able to, to choose and train on and utilize those pieces of equipment because that is the most important time for you to know how to do that.
Last but not least in my knapsack, this is my water filtration device. Uh, and I keep this in a blue bag for hopefully obvious reasons, but I keep these in period style bags so that it doesn't ruin the ambiance for anyone else, but it still, again, is very easily recognizable. Um, I tend to a Sawyer squeeze filter. Um, I have a Sawyer squeeze mini and this is the regular size. These bags you fill up with the water that you want to purify and then you utilize the filter itself screwing it on the end of the bag here if it will do it. There we go. And then I have a cap covering the nozzle where the water comes out. So I fill it up, I fill this bag up with water and I can squeeze the bag and it forces the water down through the filter and out the nozzle. Now there's some key things to remember when you use these. Um, I like a filter that has a very small diameter nozzle for the clean water to come out of. And that is because 18th century style canteens like this oftentimes have fairly narrow spouts and I don't want the water from a larger uh, spout from a filter spilling out all over the place and wasting my time. Lastly, I will also carry as another redundancy some water purification tablets. If I don't have the ability to use my filter again, I'm injured to a point where I can't uh, operate the filter itself, I will still at least have a way to purify some water at some level. This is my equipment that I carry when I'm out on an 18th century backpacking trip. I've taken time to painstakingly document a lot of this equipment and, and a good bit of it you've seen in prior videos. As a matter of fact, and I'll, I'll put a link to the video in the description, um, in my video where I talk about preparing for immersive um, living history journeys, you'll notice that the equipment doesn't really change that much. And that's because I carry nearly all of the same equipment nearly all of the time. I want to be as good as I can with the equipment that I have and that I can document. And then I want to be able to show others um, how they can do the same thing. That's ultimately the goal here with this channel and my, my, uh, in my heart, that's my goal is public education. I hope you've enjoyed this time with me and I can't tell you how much I enjoy you spending your time with me here on the Deerskin Diary and we'll see you next time.